you want to know how to generate great lyrics? Well stick around because I'm going to give you some ways you can start doing just that today. This is part 2 of a 3 part series. If you haven't seen the first one where we talked about ways to generate endless lyric and song ideas, check it out here. Now in part 2 I'll be getting into how you can develop those ideas and start shaping them into lyrics. So let's get to it. Hi, I'm Tony from Songwriters Chop Shop. In part 1 I give you an easy to use formula to help generate song and lyric ideas. Now I want to give you a second way to use that exact same formula to generate more specific lyrical ideas. So we take idea 1 and idea 2 and we list everything associated with each idea. People, places, things, events, words, phrases, images, cliches and even opposites. Then look over the list and start to think about how each one of the items in each column could relate to each other. When you make your lists, make sure not to edit yourself. The longer the lists, the more possibilities. So take your time. I'd suggest doing about 10-15 minutes on each column. Take two ideas at a time, letting more emerge out of the connections. Do this by imposing the values of one idea onto the other by association and then asking the W questions that we talked about in the first video. This should help generate a lot of lyric ideas. You might also find a linking term and this is a good way to find a theme that emerges organically. The theme and emotion slash attitude is a way to focus your ideas. Think of it as your guide. You can go explore your ideas in any way you want knowing you have somewhere to come back to and something to tie it all together. You can go off on tangents and then pick out things that fit into the theme and emotion. This allows you to keep focused and disregard any material that isn't a fit for your song. This way you can write a little or a lot and be confident you have whatever material you need to write your lyrics. Let's look at a quick example from the Miss Volcano idea we came up with in video 1. This is a short version of the lists, but we take one item from each column and brainstorm how they can be linked. So linking red hot and scorn, I got spewing red hot stone till there's nothing left but ash and bone. Then playing with the idea of our theme and attitude, i.e. it's weird how sometimes we know we will regret something, yet we still do it, this lyric idea started to emerge. Miss Volcano spewing red hot stone till there's nothing left but ash and bone but I keep coming back for more. The rhymes were a coincidence but you'll find that happens quite a lot. So let's move on. Because this video is more of a deep dive into generating imagery, phrases and words that evoke an emotional response in the listener which should be one of your main aims when it comes to lyric writing, I want to give you something to consider when all is said and done. Sometimes the right lyric isn't even a word. Hey! With a song, there's so much at work to convey meaning, emotion and attitude, so we don't need to use words like we do in conversation. It's kind of like if you ever ask someone a question and they give you a one word answer but the look on their faces spoke volumes. In songwriting terms, that look can be thought of as all the musical and structural elements that are happening around and underneath the lyric. Often, less is more. There's rhythm, harmony and melody all working together, so like too many people speaking at once would be too much information to take in, using too many words can interfere with everything else that is playing its part to communicate the message of the song. Think of space as an element of a song, not the absence of elements. Space leaves a place for the audience to insert themselves in. Songwriting, like any other kind of art, is an interaction with its audience. Don't regard the audience as a passive onlooker to your song or performance. Think about it. Have you ever looked at a singer or a band or even a TV show without engaging with it? Well, of course you have, and they'll be the things that you've watched and lost interest in after about two seconds. Songwriting, like any art is an active exchange of energy between the finished piece and its audience. So let's get into how you can shape your ideas into words, phrases and imagery that can express your lyrics in the right way. A good lyricist can say a lot with only a few words. It sounds simple, but simple isn't always easy. One of the first ways to start digging into your basic idea to generate great lyrics is sense-bound writing. If you've ever looked up anything about songwriting, you've probably heard of this, so I'm not going to go on about it too much. If, by some chance, you haven't heard of it before, I recommend checking out Pat Patterson and his book, Writing Better Lyrics. The sense-bound writing is one of the best ways to make a general idea unique and specific to your own artistic voice, and it does exactly what it says on the tin. It's basically a stream of consciousness focused through the lens of your senses on an object or subject. By writing about something through the senses, it's likely to evoke a sense-bound emotional reaction in the listener. Since this should be done without too much thought, like a stream of consciousness, it's a good idea to develop your senses, and that's what I want to do, give you some ways and ideas to develop your senses for creative work. 
work. While there's plenty of information out there about how to do sense-bound writing, I've not come across a lot of information about how to hone your senses and make this type of writing more fruitful. After all, we experience our whole life through the senses. As Leonardo da Vinci said, the five senses are the ministers of the soul, but most people look without seeing, listen without hearing, touch without feeling, and talk without thinking. He just blurted that out one day out of nowhere. Anyway, here are some simple ways to give your senses a creative workout. Vision. Start to become aware and notice how colors harmonize or clash in nature, on clothes, in paintings, graffiti, anywhere you see color, notice how they interact. Do you know the color of all your friends' eyes or have you ever examined your own? Really look at all the subtle shades and shapes in your own eyes and other people's, without freaking them out of course. Practice describing a scene in detail. Find a photo you like or look at a sunset and describe its colors, shapes and textures. For example, don't just say there's a tree. How many subtle colors and textures are really at play? Then practice visualizing that picture in as much detail as you can recall. Try the eye palming exercise. You simply sit quietly, breathe deeply, close your eyes, cup your hands, then place your hands over your eyes. Sit there for about three to five minutes. Then when you're ready, take your hands away. Don't open your eyes just yet. Maybe roll them around a couple of times Then slowly open your eyes and look around you. You might notice that the colors seem brighter and that everything seems sharper and more defined. Focus on objects near and far. Look at something that is at the limit of your sight and try and see as much detail as you can. Then look at something really close to you. Even your hand, again, notice all the detail you can. Use soft eyes. Gently blur your vision and just look at the things around you and notice the general shapes and colors. Take a look at some of the artwork from your favorite artists and notice the colors, shapes and textures at play. Even look at them upside down so you don't see the picture as you normally would and follow the contours of the shapes with your eyes. Learn how to draw or even trace pictures just focusing on one line at a time. Go for a walk and focus on your vision alone. Just look at things around you. No one internal commentary, just observe. Hearing. Practice listening to the sounds around you and the space those sounds exist in. Try and notice when someone's singing off key. Listen to music and single out an instrument or a production element and focus your ears on it. Can you hear the difference when you change sounds on your stereo or DAW or whatever you listen to music on? Notice what more or less bass sounds like or too much treble. If you have an EQ on, pick out one frequency to exaggerate and listen to a few different songs with that frequency turned up. Learn to listen to silence. Listen to a person person's tone, pitch, rhythm, volume and inflections and how they change as that person speaks. Listen to the sounds in the room you're in, then extend your focus to just outside the room and gradually keep extending that circle of concentration as far as you can. Listen to hear patterns of tension and release in music. Try to appreciate your favorite music in terms of elements. Earth, wind, fire, water. Does a certain chord progression seem like it's fire or sand? Can you easily identify subgenres of music? Listen to the emotional quality of your favorite singers and how it changes throughout a song. Make a playlist and pair the perfect music with an activity that you're doing and notice the effect on your mood that music has. Smell. Do you have a favorite smell? Do certain smells bring up certain memories or emotions? If they did, what would they be? Can you recognize your favorite person just by their scent? Do you notice how certain smells and aromas affect your mood? Can you smell the quality of your food? Is it fresh or going off? Do you like to smell flowers? Go into a flower shop and smell different types of flowers with your eyes closed. Notice the smells around you right now. Smell different things with your eyes closed. Objects that you encounter every day and usually pay no attention to. Have you ever smelled your phone or your keys? Smell herbs and aromatherapy oils and notice any sensations that arise. Taste. Can you taste the freshness of your food? Do you enjoy a variety of foods or do you eat the same things all the time? Try new foods and notice how they taste. Even try it blindfolded and describe what you're eating in terms of texture. Don't just use the word sweet, describe the taste of sweet. Can you identify different ingredients like herbs and spices in a recipe? Can you tell which foods go together well and with what drinks? Take time to savor a meal and notice the textures and tastes. Can you notice the difference in the different brands of the same product like honey or chocolate? Even try wine tasting. Touch. Are you aware of the feel of the surfaces around you? The furniture, the walls, pets, fabrics? Do you give hugs? Or have you ever noticed how a hug really feels? Can you feel if someone is tense or relaxed, hot or cold? Go out to nature and touch the grass or a tree with your eyes closed. Just close your eyes and touch things and do not use this as an excuse to grope your crush. Synesthesia. Can you describe one sense in terms of another? Do colors feel hot or cold? Do you physically react to art, music and movies? Research synesthesia in artists 
artists like Jimi Hendrix and Leonardo da Vinci. Draw music and the energy of the different sections of a song. Look at a picture and vocalize the sound inspired by it. No words, just sounds. What would music taste like or a rainbow sound like? What would a country song sound like if it was an EDM track or if an artist was an athlete? Pick a specific problem or challenge and give it a color, shape and texture. Imagine what it smells like and what it tastes like and how it feels. Then what are the textures, tastes, shapes, colors and sounds of possible solutions? Organic sense. This is the awareness of your inner body functions such as your heartbeat, your pulse rate, muscle tensions and breathing. The unconscious functions that you're usually not aware of only in reactive situations like being nervous. Close your eyes and try putting your attention on your hands or your feet and just notice how they feel. Kinesthetic. Spatial awareness. This is your awareness and sense of relation to the world around you, especially when you're in motion, like being in an elevator or a roller coaster. Without looking, try and put your attention on what is behind you or above you. Developing your senses a little will take your sense-bound writing to a whole other level and give you a lyric writing superpower. That is, only if you're interested in becoming a lyrical genius. All it takes is a little consistent practice over time. You might think, that'll take too long and I'll be ancient by the time I get really good at it. Well guess what, you'll be the same age no matter what you do, so you might as well develop a skill set along the way. If sensebound writing is a new concept to you, hit me up in the comments with any questions because it really is something worth having in your regular practice. Because sensebound writing is best done like a stream of consciousness, you'll have written without much thought. A lot of what you have will be pretty generic and that's fine. We can always find more powerful words to energize what you've written. The difference in great writing will nearly always be how you write, not what you write. So putting some thought into the words you use can make a huge difference. We want to look at the verbs especially and also the adjectives and adverbs. Specific detail can generate specific emotions, so it's all about finding the right pictures. The easiest way to do this is to look up synonyms on thesaurus.com and find more exciting versions of your words. See which words create a stronger imagery, more suitable for your lyrics. For example, which of these paint a more vivid picture? Red sky or crimson ether? My broken heart is a yelping dog or my shattered hope is a wounded wolf howling at a waning moon? Okay, so I went a bit overboard with that one, but you get the point. The imagery is more potent and visceral. We can have an erupting volcano causing devastation or we can have Miss Volcano spewing red hot stone till there's nothing left but ash and bone. Using the right words can be the difference between an exciting visual lyric and a forgettable dull song that expects all the other elements to do the heavy lifting. Now a lot of songs won't call for it but it's better to have the tool and be able to wield it than using the same dead cliche for the millionth time. Sometimes writing is about painting the right pictures to evoke the right emotions and that metaphor brings us nicely to the next step. Metaphors and similes. Metaphors and similes are a powerful way to shape your ideas to generate great lyrics but again there's tons of information out there about how to create them and how to use them so instead of showing you how to make them I want to show you some ways you can make the most out of them. If metaphors and similes are new to you just hit me up in the comments and I'll point you in the right direction. In fact just use the formula as presented in the beginning of this video it's a pretty good way to come up with them. The first way we can get more bang for our buck with metaphors and similes is to have the comparative word or phrase known as the vehicle reveal insights and as much about the subject or tenor as the comparison itself. Some stand-up comedians are great at this. I think songwriters can learn a lot from comedians in this respect. You count syllables, you know, to get it just, it's more like songwriting. But don't just take Seinfeld's word for it. Let's look at a simile by a comedian that is actually funny. Kobe cheated, right? Shouldn't that relationship been over right then? Why did she hang around like some jaded cop for three years trying to get a fucking pension? The imagery is specific and unique. Also, the comparison reveals the point Bill is trying to make about the subject. Lots of things hang around, like monkeys, mountain climbers, Spider-Man, farts. But none of those things would have revealed as much about Bill's point of view as the jaded cop hanging on for a pension. Let's look at it in song form. In Hosier's Take Me to Church, my lover's got humor, she's the giggle at a funeral, knows everybody's disapproval, I should have worshipped her sooner. This metaphor doesn't just let us know his lover has a sense of humor, it gives us an insight into what her sense of humor is like. So the comparison is doing its job and the thing the subject is being compared to reveals something more about the subject. Metaphors should be clear so don't close the listener off or shut them out, show it to them through the senses. Metaphors should be able to evoke an emotional response. And how do we make things emotional? Through verbs. Motion causes emotion. In the Miss Volcano example, I didn't tell you Miss Volcano had mood swings, I drew a word picture 
picture of the aftermath of her eruptions. And the same goes for similes. Look at Billie Eilish's song My Boy. My boy loves his friends like I love my split ends and by that I mean he cuts them off. Again, lots of things can be cut off. Power, association, fingers. But split ends hint at something that's damaged and outgrown. So we're getting more of a description through imagery not only about a boy but his relationship with his friends. Metaphors transfer attention to the thing the subject is being compared to. Similes don't. Similes are useful for a one-time comparison like split ends. Metaphors are good for extending the idea like with Hosier. And because they can take some work to get to, why not use this to our advantage? So the second way we can make the most out of them is to use the comparison word or phrase as a lens to write through. All the writing you did to get to the metaphor can be used to colour the rest of the song. If we were to do this with the song we're working on, Miss Volcano, we can keep using the idea of Volcano as a lens and sprinkle its imagery throughout the song. A couple of lines I came up with. Miss Volcano gonna burn me again. At your mouth I'm a sacrifice. The ultimate example of extending a metaphor is All the World's a Stage from the Seven Ages of Man by William Shakespeare. Take a look at it and see how the metaphor is extended the whole way through. Also, you can try a little wordplay. Look at the David Guetta and Jason Derulo song Goodbye. I pull up on him, let him put the pipe in, pipe in. Then I got a dash like a hyphen, hyphen. Hilarious. You can also finesse metaphors and similes by using a more indirect approach. Remember, one of the definitions of a metaphor is to see one thing as another. And we don't always have to use the words as or is if the comparison is implicit. Look at Frank Ocean's Thinking About You. A tornado flew around my room before you came. Excuse the mess it made. It usually doesn't rain in Southern California. Good metaphors and similes can take time and effort, but it's worth it. When you find a perfect one, you'll feel as satisfied as Matthew McConaughey smelling his own farts. So the last thing I want to talk about for generating great lyrics is to learn to look at your ideas from different perspectives. Talk to someone about your ideas or jump on a songwriting form and get a fresh take. Step back and come back to it the next day with new eyes. Do some research on the subject. Think about how another person would feel about it. What are your assumptions about the ideas and what is the exact opposite of the subject? Ask yourself what would it look like to a different gender if you came from a different social background or if you were 20 years older or 20 years younger. Okay guys, we'll leave it there. If you have any questions or think I've missed anything out, just hit me up in the comments. If you found the information in this video valuable, give me a thumbs up. And don't forget, in part 3, we're going to be putting all this together and forming actual lyrics. So hit subscribe to make sure you don't miss it. Catch you next time.